Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time together. And uh, we just pray you would bring revelation this morning and help us to see how our sexuality is a sacred symbol of your relationship with us that ultimately points to the good news of the gospel. And we just pray for your presence here today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about why gender matters, and it's an important topic to me as somebody who came from a transgender background. Uh, As you can see in these pictures, in the first picture, I was very much boyish growing up. I never felt content in a female body. From my earliest memory, I felt like I was a little boy and I shouldn't have been a little girl. Now, I grew up in the 1970s when nobody was talking about this, so I didn't even know what transgender was. I just knew that I felt like I was in the wrong body. It wasn't that my parents said, we wish you were a boy or any outside influences. It was something coming internally. I literally felt like I was born that way. In the next picture, you can see my my parents just thought I was a a tomboy. I liked to climb trees and play outside instead of be inside, playing Barbies with my sister and all of that. And they had no idea what I was feeling. And I, I didn't feel like it was something that I should necessarily tell the whole world, even though you could look at me and just people would mistake me, mistake me for a little boy. And it just made my world because it's like, oh, you know who I really am instead of calling me a girl. In the next picture, when I was in the fourth grade, one of the boys pushed me into the boys' bathroom and I saw this wall of urinals and I was like, what is that? I had no way, there was no idea there was a, another way the other half lived. <laughs> and um, that became a symbol of this forbidden world that I couldn't get into. And one of my greatest dreams was, and I'm just gonna be really real here this morning, right? One of my greatest dreams was like, I wanna be able to use a urinal just like a boy. And I wanna be able to have male genitalia, the whole thing. And it just became a fixation where I began visiting boys' restrooms. And nobody even batted an eye when I was in there. They thought I belonged there because I looked so much like a boy. And as I grew up and got older, that turned into a symbol that became actually a sexual fetish and an addiction in my life. As I moved into uh, junior high in the next picture, you can see I still was just looking rather androgynous. And around that time, when all the other girls were discovering, you know, blossoming into womanhood and experimenting with makeup and wanting to date boys, I wanted nothing to do with that world. In fact, I started to despise my body that was showing signs of femininity. I felt trapped in this body. I hated it. I became suicidally depressed. I had no friends, because nobody wants to be friends with somebody who's depressed and despairing. And I became intensely jealous of the boys around me whose voices were changing, and they were becoming everything that I wanted to be. And it was around this same time that I discovered not only was I having these desires to be a man, but I was also attracted to women. I didn't choose that, I didn't want that, I was horrified by it, but I felt helpless to change. And there was no one to talk to in the 1980s, there was no safe zone, no LGBT club, I couldn't talk to my parents, nobody in the church was talking about it, I wasn't even saved at the time anyway. It was a very lonely, hard existence. So I I can empathize with those in our culture today that are dealing with these issues and not knowing how to handle that. In the next picture, you can see in late junior high, I'm still dealing with all of this, and I started to think, um, when I was in fourth grade, when I showed you that picture of the urinals, around that time, I heard about these things called, back then, we called them sex change operations. Now, I'm in fourth grade, and it was like, really? You can, like, go to the hospital, have an operation, become a boy, and, you know, live the rest of your life as a boy. That's what I'm going to do. As soon as I'm old enough and I have enough money, I will change my name to David, I will get the sex change, and I will live happily ever after. Now, I had no idea about going to two years of counseling and hormone replacement therapy. I had no clue what was involved. I just, in my fourth grade mind, I just literally thought I could have this operation and become a boy. And so my plan was, uh, in sixth grade, when I found out I was attracted to women, I was like, oh no, this is horrible, and I can't talk to anybody about this, and why is this happening? And I thought, well, if I really am a girl, a boy, trapped in a girl's body, if I get the sex change, then that will make my life make sense. I'm just, I'm really, it'll make me just a straight man. And so I thought, I just need to hold out until I can have that operation, and my whole life will line up. Well, in late junior high, I was thinking through the ramifications of having a sex change operation, and I thought, wait a minute. (laughs) Um, You can't just leave the house one day as Linda and come back the next day as David, and like nobody's gonna know. (laughs) And so I was like, I don't know how to tell my parents. Like, what would my parents think? What would the neighbors think? What would my grandparents think? You know, I just, 
the, the horror of telling other people was so embarrassing. I was so ashamed of what was going on. I didn't want to be that way. And I didn't have the boldness. If I had grown up in today's generation, I probably would have transitioned in a heartbeat. But our culture was different back then. And I'm not saying it was great. We weren't doing a great job responding to people necessarily, but at least there was enough moral restraint that I didn't feel the freedom to just go out and do that. So I made a decision in late junior high. I, I thought, I have two options. I can either run away, have the operation, live happily ever after but never see my family again, or I could not have the operation, keep my family, but know that I'll be consigned to a life of suicidal despair and loneliness. And I remember the day I consciously chose option B because I knew my family loved me and I didn't want to live the rest of my life alone, even if it meant I could be a man. So I decided from that point forward, I better grow my hair out and try to be enough of a girl that nobody notices uh, what's going on. So in the next picture, you can see I, I tried to grow my hair out a little bit. I had a mullet for a period of time, which was not the best idea, but it was a popular, uh, <laughs> popular hairstyle for soccer players, male soccer players at the time. Um, I did eventually progress to growing my hair out all the way, and um, I tried dating boys because I thought if maybe there's something dormant in me that if I start dating boys and experimenting sexually with them, it'll awaken something that's been dormant in me this whole time trying to be attracted to boys. So in the next picture, you can see me and my uh, friend Brian from my physics class that I invited to the turnabout dance where the girls asked the guys, here I am standing in a borrowed dress from my sister, standing like a football player next to Di uh, Brian. There were no sparks flying that night. It was my first of many attempts to try to date boys and be normal. And I'm telling you, it just it didn't resolve the issue. In fact, you can see um, in the next picture, every time I dressed up and went to prom or did those things, I just felt like a man dressing in drag. I felt like I was wearing a costume. I did not feel comfortable in a female body at all. As I continued in uh, high school, my junior year, in the next picture you can see, I actually got saved. I met Jesus. I thought the next morning I would wake up and all these desires would go away. And the next morning, it didn't happen. I was equally attracted to women. I was still desiring to be a man. And now I'm a part of the body of Christ and nobody's talking about this. So I thought, man, now I'm really in a catch-22. And uh, I'm gonna have to really fool people. And so I, I just did whatever I had to do to survive. I was living a double life. Nobody knew about the sexual addictions. I had gotten exposed to pornography when I was about 10 years old. I had rampant sexual addictions and was living a, a double life behind closed doors that nobody knew. Until my senior year in college, you can see in the next picture, I'm in my senior Bible study there. I'm madly attracted to the woman in the blue um, directly above me in the Illinois sweatshirt. She was my Bible study leader. And I just, I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. I couldn't take it. And I was listening to a speaker one day talk about if you have habitual repetitive sin and you can't get free, the answer is James 5.16. Confess your sins one to another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. I didn't hear anything else that speaker said. I just knew that until I take what's in the dark and I bring it into the light with a trusted leader, I'll never be free. And I was so desperate to be free. So I asked my campus pastor if we could talk. Um, I had to wait a couple days. I, I nearly committed suicide in the days waiting because I thought, I, how can I tell somebody else? I'm 21 years old, my family doesn't know. Uh, the campus pastor is gonna kick me out of the group. This is a terrible decision. By God's grace, I didn't take my life and I got together with my campus pastor and, I told him my deepest, darkest secret, and I was cringing. I was kind of waiting for him to rebuke me and kick me out of the group because I was a worship leader. They were recruiting me to come on staff with their campus ministry, and I thought if they even knew who I really was, they would be horrified. And my campus pastor, when I told him my deepest, darkest, shameful secret, looked me in the eyes and he said, Linda, I wanna thank you for sharing that information with me. And I know that took a lot of courage, and I wanna let you know this doesn't change our opinion of you. We love you. We see the hand of God on your life, and we want to get you the help that you need. Now, my friends, that was 1994. You don't understand what a phenomenal response that was in that culture at that time. And I'm so grateful to John Swanson and his response to me, because had he responded any other way, I was suicidal. I probably would have taken my life. And it's because of his influence that started what was to be an 11-year journey of transformation in my life. I, I didn't know it would be 11 years, I probably wouldn't have signed up for the trip, right? But it was this intense process of discipleship and sanctification, redemptive relationships in the body of Christ, inner healing and deliverance. It's not easy, you don't just flip a switch. But it's the process that the Bible talks about of sanctification of the soul, your mind, your emotions, and your will. Aligning my mind to match the body that God gave me. 
And over a period of time, my appearance went from being an androgynous female, as you can see in the next picture, to um, embracing who God really called me to be. You see in the next picture, the, the drastic difference where I was embracing who I really am. This time, not to fool people, but to, to really step into, I enjoy being a woman. God has totally resolved those issues in my life. I no longer feel like a woman, a man trapped in a female body. I don't want a sex change. I don't want male genitalia. I'm not sneaking into the men's restroom at this conference and trying to use a urinal. Like, that's not who I am anymore, praise the living God. And he, amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I'm no longer attracted to women. There was a phase in my life as God began to heal that and those, those attractions were diminishing that I, I wasn't attracted to men or women. But in my mid to late 30s, as I continued to walk out my healing and God was restoring me, these attractions to men began to develop, uh, which was awkward and thrilling all at the same time. Um, so today I'm a 47-year-old single woman, wholly attracted to men, content as a female. I am single and ready to mingle. Um, and I, I missed my prime dating years for obvious reasons. So um, when I speak in AG venues, I say, you know, you all can be my AG harmony and help a sister out. So. Uh, Pastor Mark has my email if you need it, so. <laughs> anyway, what I wanna talk to you today is, is why gender matters, and basically what I wanna do is lay a foundation for a biblical theology of sexuality and why our sexuality actually images the good news of the gospel. So we're gonna look at four questions. The first one is, who is God? Secondly, who are we in light of who God is? Third one is, what are the implications for sexual practice? And then finally, what about sexual orientation and gender identity? How do we look at that from a theological perspective? So the first question is this, who is God? First, God is a creative being who rules over all of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Secondly, God is a relational being. So in the beginning, God said, let us make mankind in our image. The us and the our is a veiled reference to the Trinity, that God exists in this divine community of holy love. And the essence of the gospel is this. It's not a prayer you pray to get into heaven when you die. It is an invitation to be restored to your creator and to join the divine community of holy love, to receive that invitation to be in relationship with this benevolent king and to live in such a way that we persuade other people to join us in worship around his worthy throne. That's the gospel. It's all about relationship. It's all about pointing the way to Jesus and that's what our sexuality does. Thirdly, God is a paradoxical mystery who exists as unity in diversity because of the Trinity, right? God is three distinct persons, one unified God. We see this in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. When we read that in English, we don't realize the nuance that is there in the Hebrew. When you look at the Hebrew, it says, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, Elohim, which means gods, plural. The Lord is one, Ichad, which means one in essence, not necessarily one in number, but one in essence. So you have this plurality in, in unity within the Godhead. It's a paradoxical mystery. So if we were to summarize those three things, and, and mind you, I'm like minimizing God down to three aspects this morning, which we all know is like not really real because he's infinite, right? Um, but for the sake of time, it's just three aspects. And so if we were to summarize and say who is God, we would say God is a relational creator who welcomes us to join his divine community of holy love that exists as unity in diversity. Now, since we are made in the image of God, we should reflect those same three aspects that I just mentioned. And so if you look at that, we are made in God's image. God said, let us make mankind in our image. And so we reflect God, just like in this next picture, you see a, a kitten. No, you don't, yes, you do. There's a kitten, and so he's looking into the mirror, and so he, he, you see the, the kitten sees its reflection. Now, the reflection is not the kitten, and the kitten is not the reflection. In the same way that we reflect God, we are not God, but we are to reflect God in what he looks like. People should be able to look at our lives and our, the way we practice our sexuality and learn about the character and the nature of God. And so first, how do we reflect God? Number one, we are procreative beings, just like our creator. 
So God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. So we are to procreate, fill the earth and rule over it in the same way that our creator creates, created us and rules over the universe, right? So we image our creator in that way. Second, we image God's relational capacity where God said it wasn't good for Adam to be alone. And so in the context of relationship, he creates Eve, and out of that intimacy comes progeny, comes, comes children. And Adam and Eve invite those children to, do, to join that, that community of holy love, the family that God creates. A nuclear family was God's ideal idea, and it images the divine community of holy love. And then thirdly, we have this paradoxical mystery of unity in diversity, where in Genesis 1, 26, God said, let us make mankind in our image male and female. We image unity and diversity in this room because we are unified in our humanity, but we're diversified in our male humanness and our female humanness. Unity in diversity. And here's the cool thing. We even image the unity and diversity within the Godhead in marriage where, where Genesis 2.24 says, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh, same word in the Hebrew, ichad. The two become one in essence. Our sexuality is a mystery that images the, the mystery of our creator. Now, if we were to take these same things with humanity, Adam and Eve being procreative relational beings that exist as unity and diversity, the same principles are true of our relationship as the church with our groom, Jesus. So if we look at first the procreative capacity, no one comes into the kingdom unless they are born again. We are new creations in Christ. And we are even commanded to go and make disciples of all nations. And so we reproduce spiritually our DNA in others and we make disciples of those who go out and make disciples and their spiritual reproduction in the kingdom in a creative sense. Secondly, we are relational in our relationship with Jesus. He doesn't just want you know, people that bow down and worship him, he's looking for a bride. He's looking for a deep, intimate relationship. So 1 Corinthians 6 talks about, do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body, for the two will become one flesh, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. There's a mystery, a mingling of our spirit with the Lord's spirit when we get saved. There's also Ephesians 5 that talks about, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, ichad. And this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. So there's this intense relational capacity between Christ and his bride, the church. And then last, there's the paradoxical mystery of unity in diversity in the sense that the two become one where we are unified with Jesus in his humanity. He's 100% human and we're human, but we're diversified in that he is 100% God and we are not. Unity in diversity, everything pointing the way to the gospel. And so what I'm not saying here, um, uh, this is the reason why Jesus never married. Everything in the, the Old Testament and the New Testament is pointing towards marriage. So in the Old Testament, it was like, you know, the Israel was called an adulterer by not being faithful to God. And in the New Testament, we see Jesus revealing himself as the bridegroom, waiting for his bride. And this is why Jesus never married. If we were to summarize the gospel in a word, we could say, God wants to marry us. Hosea 2, 19, I, I will betroth you to me forever. Now, what I'm not saying is God wants to have sex with us. You never heard me say that. God is spirit. So we're not talking about physical relations here. We're talking about the spiritual dimension. And God is not male nor female. He is the source of all things male and female. And we, we understand how we relate to God as Father and God the Son. But there are also feminine aspects to God's character and nature because he is the source of all things male and female. And so you see this imaged in the Bible, like in Isaiah, where God says, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you, and you will be comforted over Jerusalem. Or Jesus saying, as, as, oh Jerusalem, I long to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. There's a nurturing capacity. The Holy Spirit is known as our nurturer, our comforter, right? And there are even aspects in the Bible where, you know, just to be born again 
In one sense, there, there, there are verses in the New Testament and the Old Testament that talk about the God of the universe giving birth, which is really a female quality, right? But there are aspects of God's character and nature where he is the source of everything we understand as male and female to help communicate to us what God is like. And so he uses marriage in that capacity to show us what kind of intense relationship he wants to have with us. I like the way Mary Stuart Van Leeuwen says it in her book, sexuality as part of God's image is the human drive toward intimate communion. More than a mere physical itch that needs scratching, it urges us to experience the other, to trust the other, and to be trusted by that other person. To enter the other's life by entering the vital embrace of his or her body. Of course, the search toward mutual trust and self-disclosure is also present in friendships and family relationships at their best. But with the urge for sexual intercourse, there comes the added dimension of passion, ecstasy, and throwing off restraint. Thus, sexual intimacy involves at one time the maximum degree of risk, and if it goes badly, and the maximum promise of communion if it goes well. And so this is a picture of the kind of God we worship who wants an intimate, risk-taking, all-consuming, mutual love relationship with us. Our sexuality images the, the relational capacity that God wants to have with us. So let's look at the third question. What are the implications for sexual practice given what we see God's, deter, God's design for sexuality? First of all, we note this. God did not create sexuality with morality or rules in mind. He created sexuality to image the relational mystery of the Trinity with the ultimate goal that redeemed humans would be vessels of God's divine presence who invite others to join his divine community of holy love. And so as we look at our sexual practice, what we see in the Bible is that any sexual practice that doesn't image these three things that I talked about, the procreational capacity, the relational capacity, the unity and diversity, is forbidden. And so it's essentially, if we don't image the mystery of the Trinity in our sexuality, then that is the practice that is that forbidden. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in reverse order of those three things as I talk about the implications for sexual practice, and you'll see why it's easier to do it in reverse order. First, let's look at unity in diversity. Anything that violates the principle of unity in diversity is forbidden. For example, divorce is not an option since the Trinity can never be disunified or divorce. It's never meant to be broken. As Dennis Hollinger says, just as the oneness of the divine trinity cannot be broken or pulled apart, so the oneness from the covenant relationship sealed by the sexual union is not to be pulled apart. This is the same reason why bestiality or sex with animals is forbidden. There is too much diversity and no unity. When God created the animals and he was searching for a helper among the animals for Adam, no helper was found because there is no um, compatibility between animals and humans. And so too much diversity, no unity, and zero capacity to procreate with an animal. And thirdly, this is why homosexual practice is forbidden. Because there's too much unity and no diversity. It's unity and sameness rather than unity in diversity, and again, no capacity to procreate, so you can't fulfill the procreational mandate. This is fundamentally why homosexual practice is forbidden. It's not because God hates gay people and people who experience same-sex attractions, transgender desires, and this generation, by the way, they don't wanna know that homosexual practice is wrong. They wanna know why. This is the why. Theologically speaking, it doesn't image the character and the nature of our creator. And then, thirdly, or relationally, or secondly, dealing with the relational capacity. There are th sexual acts that are not relational, that are forbidden in the Bible, because God's design for sexuality is one man with one woman in a covenant relationship for life, in a covenant relationship that demonstrates the eternal covenant we have with the Lord. And that is why, uh, for example, adultery and fornication are forbidden. There is no covenantal relationship between people sleeping together before marriage or somebody violating their marriage covenant. That is why rape is forbidden. God would never use you and discard you. 
That's why pornography is not God's design. It is something that is done in isolation. There is no human relationship, no covenant, no intimacy with somebody. That's why even masturbation is not God's design for sexuality. It's, again, something that's done in isolation, completely selfish, no capacity for relationship or procreation there. And then third, looking at the procreative capacity. Obviously, with homosexuality and bestiality, I already mentioned there's no ability to procreate in that regard. Uh, pedophilia, a relationship with a child that is under age, not God's design for sexuality. And again, that violates the child problems on every level, not God's design for covenant sexuality. Uh, finally, this doesn't refer to infertility conditions. We all know that there are people who marry and they expect to have children and for one reason or another, they're just not able to, so they visit a doctor and they say, can we run some tests? Can we figure out what might be wrong because we're, we're sure we should be able to conceive, but for some reason we're not. Now, there are things we can do to help couples that are infertile, and we don't recognize that as, you know, that's just something that happens because we live in a fallen world. But you will never see two gay people go to the doctor and say, doctor, we just cannot figure out. <laughs> we just don't understand why we can't conceive a child and reproduce, right? Because it's not God's design for sexuality. Next question, what are the implications for sexual orientation and gender identity? Well, first of all, I've already said before, our gender is sacred. It is meant to be the sacred symbol that points to the gospel, that points to the kind of relationship Jesus wants to have with his bride. And that's why the enemy hates our sexuality and wants to destroy it. And my friends, everything that's going on in our culture right now, this is not just fallen humanity. This is driven by demonic strongholds, which I'm gonna talk about in the next breakout session, what's actually going on in the spirit realm behind all of this. But these demonic strongholds, it has never been about legalizing gay marriage. Yeah. This is not even about the Equality Act and getting transgender rights passed. Yeah. This is a scheme of the enemy to yeah. destroy sexuality and gender because it images the good news of the gospel, and he hates it. Right. And so we need to recognize what's going on in our culture, amen, and take our stand against it and say, no, we're not bowing our knee to a lie. We will stand for the truth, and here's what God's truth is. Even with the transgender desires and, and all of that stuff, I get it, I felt that. I have compassion for people that are walking in that. But the reality is this. Even our chromosomes image God because your chromosomes will remain the same yesterday, today, and forever. You will never change. I will forever be XX. Men will forever be XY chromosomes. Even in my glorified body, when Jesus was raised from the dead, he appeared in a glorified body as a man. You will retain your gender, which to me was like a horrifying thought when you know, I was not happy in my body, uh, but now I get it. It's, it's awesome that God has created us to image his unity in diversity. Now the world doesn't know how to explain this, and so they have come up with a fallen explanation of how to explain how somebody could be same-sex attracted or have gender dysphoria, and so they've come up with some witty um, pictures, one of them being the gender-bred person, and so the gender-bred person explains how you could have four different aspects of your sexuality that don't necessarily align. So the first one they point out is your gender identity is what goes on in your mind, in your head. So for me, even though my physical body was female, in my head I felt like I was a man. And so my gender identity, this world would say, is, oh, you're a male. And so they call you a trans male. And so there's a gender identity that is different, says the world, than your gender expression, which is your body and how you present. Like today, I'm wearing long hair and makeup and clothes that are feminine, so you would recognize me as a woman, and I'm not doing this as a costume, I like, really like these clothes. So, <laughs> but in our culture, you can present as a man, you can present as a woman, and our fallen culture says, your gender identity and your gender expression is different than your biological sex. So that's your anatomy that God gives you. By the way, sex is not assigned at birth. It is determined, it is designed by your creator. Hallelujah. Right? So we can't give in to the lies of this world and we need to push back. And then they say, finally, all three of these categories are different than your sexual orientation, which are the affections of your heart, you might be, in my case, feeling like a man in your head, presenting androgynously, externally, 
even though an anatomically you're a female, but in your heart you're attracted to females instead of men. Now, the world would explain it by creating these false categories. Do you understand? These are categories that we are accepting even in the church now. The concept of sexual orientation and gender identity are modern constructs to describe disordered desires. The, the, the concept of gender, well, let me start this way. Sexual orientation has only been around the concept for a little over 100 years. And it was created by a gay man to try to remove the stigma of you know, people not liking people who are gay. And we've just accepted that, that there is something called a sexual orientation and that it's fixed, it's inborn, and it's immutable. That's not actually what the science says. And at the, the, at the afternoon session today, I'll share some of the, what the science actually shows us. It's not what the media is telling you. You're not born that way, and it's not a civil rights issue the same way that skin color or you know, ethnicity or something is, right? So. Um, the other thing is with gender identity, the concept of gender only came about in the 1950s. It's very new, and it was used in studying intersex people, and it, that's a whole confusing thing, I won't get into that, but like, we never had this concept. It, it always was biologically, you're male, biologically, you're female, and no concept of what you are in your head. If what's going on in your head doesn't line up with the body that God created you, that's a red flag indicator, something is off in the soul. Something's off in the mind, the will, and the emotions. And the Lord wants to come in and bring healing to that, bring integration so that you align in your soul with the physical body that he gave you. The answer is not changing my body to match my fallen mind. The answer is to renew my mind to match the body that God gave me. Amen? And so scripture talks about this um, in Ephesians 2, or Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. It says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, to be, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. For my case, my transgender desires, same-sex attractions, those were deceitful desires. They were lying to me. Now, they were real. I really was attracted to women. I really did feel like a man trapped in a body. In a, in a women's body. It's, it's not that the desires weren't real, but they were lying to me about my identity and who God created me to, de, to be. And so what I did in, in this whole process, this 11 year process that I was talking about, I put off my old self, which was being corrupted. I said, that's not who I am. I am not identifying as a gay Christian. I am not identifying as a trans Christian. I mean, we don't do that for any other sin. Like, <laughs> I'm a porn addicted Christian. <laughs> I'm, I'm a lying Christian. I'm a jealous Christian. You know, I'm a, I'm a gluttonous Christian. I mean, we just, we don't do that for any, Scripture does not tell us to take the old self, embrace it as our identity, and label ourselves by it. Scripture tells us to put off the old self with its deceitful desires that are being, it's being corrupted, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. And so I needed renewal. I needed to understand where did the lie come from that somehow I think it's superior to be a man than a woman. And the Lord showed us. But you know what? It wasn't readily obvious. And we needed the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We needed prophetic words of knowledge. We needed God to guide us to the root wounds and the hooks on my soul where the enemy could grab me and pull me away to my demise. And the Holy Spirit began to shine his light through the gifts of the Spirit and illuminate those areas where I needed inner healing, where I needed to renounce lies and replace them with truth, where I needed to come out of agreement with the enemy and I needed to come into agreement with the Lord. And I needed deliverance where there were actually demonic spirits that the Lord set me free from. I'm not saying there's a spirit of homosexuality you just cast out of somebody. I just really wish that that was the case because it would have been so much easier. Uh, but there were other things that I allowed in because of my habitual repetitive sin behind closed doors and we had to deal with that. And that's why there are parts of the body of Christ right now that are not experiencing people being transformed. Mostly people who are reformed cessationists, don't believe in the gifts of the spirit, don't believe there are root issues, don't believe that there's sanctification of the soul, matching the mind with the body. They just have kind of a white knuckle it. Don't act on it, it's sin, don't act on it. And when you die, you'll be free. That's not the gospel, my friends. There is so much more to the gospel. So the gospel talks about being made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. By God's grace, I'm walking in the new self. I'm not walking in who I used to be and praise God, I don't even have desires to be who I used to be. And it's only the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit in my life living out the gospel in me and through me. 
So why does gender matter? God designed our sexuality to image the relational mystery of the Trinity so that everything we do points toward the good news of God's invitation to join his divine community of holy love, ultimately realized in the marriage between Christ and his bride, the church. Gender matters, my friends. Now, I want to leave you today with some resources because I know you're dealing with this in your churches, your youth groups, college campuses. It's rampant everywhere. And so we have, I have a DVD set called Compassion Without Compromise available in the lobby. Um, I, I think we have like 35 left uh, that we're selling for half price at this conference. Um, I'd like to not take those back on the plane, so if you want to take those, that'd be awesome. If you can't afford it, we'll give it to you for free. I'm not here to make money. I don't even get the money for that. That just goes to making further resources. Um, another resource I want to tell you about is Restory Ministries that we started to train and equip the Assemblies of God regarding homosexuality and gender identity. We have a website you can go to, you can sign up and join our mailing list, and you'll get notifications every time we have new book recommendations, we have tough topic papers like, what about conversion therapy, and can people really change, and how should we respond to gay marriage, and things like that. Um, we also have Restory School videos, which you can use to train people in your church how to minister freedom to those people that are experiencing same-sex attractions or transgender desires. Um, and then lastly, locally here, there's Outpost Ministries. Is Jonathan in the room, Jonathan Mouse? And they're here somewhere. So they have a table, I think it's out this door someplace. But they're right here in Minnesota, and they have expertise in how to deal with people, how to help people that are dealing with these kinds of issues. So I hope that encourages you today and empowers you regarding gender. We need to take our stand. Uh, this afternoon, I'm gonna talk about cancel culture and wokeness and how we are being threatened and silenced because of the stand that we have. And it all has to do with spiritual warfare and what the enemy is doing behind that. So Father, I pray that you will help us following you, taking our stand as your bride, and not being ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to all who believe. And I just thank you, Lord, for the power of your gospel in my life. It wasn't me that changed me. It wasn't even the people who helped me. It was you, Jesus. It was the power of your gospel. And I thank you that there is nothing impossible for you, Lord. Not LGBT issues, not any, anything else that we struggle with. And I thank you that you invite us to join your divine community of holy love. And you died, Jesus, for us not just to be saved, but to be sanctified body, soul, and spirit. And we thank you for it. We worship you and praise you for the glorious good news of your gospel and how our sexuality images the kind of relationship you want with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.